Our speaker will be introduced by Richard Ha. Richard is uh, from the Big Island. He's a farmer and a, a very visionary farmer and also an, an, an advocate in, of alternative energy. He's uh, been very innovative as a, small business, as a small business owner and he offers his employees profit sharing, generates electricity on his farm and is a, has property outside of Hilo. He advocates the Hawaiian practice of Ahuaha and writes a blog which is very good called Haha. Ha. If you look it up, it's really good. Please welcome Richard Ha to Manoa, please. Aloha, everyone. Um, I, I, I'm a farmer from the Big Island, as, as uh, Fred said. First of all, we're lucky to have uh, Charlie Hall here to talk to us. And his reputation precedes him. You, you folks all know what you got to do is Google his name here, Charles A.S. Hall, and you get everything you need to know. I won't have the opportunity to say what, what I'm going to say because I'm a farmer. Yeah? So I'm going to take advantage of that while I can. Okay, I'm on the farm of the Big Island, on the Hamako Coast here. Uh, we have 600 um, acres fee simple, it, um, diversified egg, tomatoes, hydroponics, uh, uh, and, and bananas and other things. I went to five peak oil conferences trying to figure out how to position our farm for the future. And then the second important thing was this concept, energy return on investment. In the net energy is what society has to run itself. And then if you think back, you know, say, uh, what it can also mean is the net energy minus the cost to get your food gives you your lifestyle. And in that simple analysis, you can equate pre-contact Hawaii to today, apples to apples. You know, energy and ag are inextricably tied to each other. Food security involves farmers farming. And if the farmer makes money, the farmers will farm. Dr. Hall's scientific approach to the issues. Help us talk about energy from a common, common point of reference. We need to be able to quantify, analyze, and categorize energy alternatives. It's not enough to say we need everything. At the end, we must find the lowest cost alternatives that work. That will result in discretionary, discretionary income so farmers and other businesses can hire. Uh, Two thirds of our economy is consumer spending. This is not rocket science. So in a long way around, what I'm basically saying is this. If we figure out alternatives that work that's cheap and we get a competitive advantage, people will have discretionary income so they can buy more tomatoes. So on behalf of the rubber slipper folks and the Big Island Community Coalition, a group of us who are determined to keep electricity rates low, enough is enough already, I take great pleasure in, in introducing Professor Charles Hall. How are we doing, okay? Okay, on this week I've been on Hawaii, it's, uh, traveling around with Richard is amazing. It's amazing. I've talked to the governor, the senators, representatives, chancellors, presidents, God knows all these potent people, I guess, and, and I guess I get the picture that they're kind of running scared. And I guess you all know that Hawaii one runs 90% on oil. I mean, it runs mostly on sunshine, the natural ecosystems and the agriculture, but in terms of uh, energy in the common sense, or the common use of the term, 90% oil, uh, your price of energy here is eight times what it is in my new state of Montana. And so these are difficult economic circumstances. Of course, you don't have to pay for much heating or air conditioning either. So that's a virtue and you can't drive very far. Um, so those are some things that might protect you a bit. Now, the thing that I have found in talking to lots of people from industry, from government, from whatever, is that the expertise tends to 
reside in the people that are connected with some point of view, uh, often industry, but it can be something else. They know a lot about energy. But the objectivity seems to reside in other quarters. Ideally, the university met some pretty good people at ELO, and I suppose there's a lot of good people here. And this should be what universities are about, about objectivity. So I want to come to you as a scientist. I am a scientist. I'm an ecologist, a systems ecologist by training, trained by a guy named Howard Odom, incredible guy. And I'm interested in two things, a systems approach, that means a comprehensive approach. And the second is the use of the scientific method. And I teach at an environmental college. And the biggest problem we have in the environmental uh, college is deprogramming our freshmen. Because they come in with a point of view, uh, fracking or nuclear or coal or what, you know, you name it, is bad. And they learn science and they use the science to defend a position. And that's the wrong approach. What you need is an independent broker. And we have various tools and it needs a lot of different people it, uh, from different disciplines. It needs geologists, it needs economists, it needs a different kind of economist, which I'll talk about today. Um, it requires environmentalists, it requires all kinds of, and people from industry. And it requires an independent broker to attempt to assess some of these things. So that uh, is behind both of my lectures. The lectures interdigitate, they support each other. Um, a couple of slides, but only a couple are the same in the two lectures. So let's uh, go on with that as a uh, beginning, and let's see if I can work this. Okay, so let's start. We're going to talk about the well-being, which many people think of as material well-being, as wealth. What, let's talk about wealth. And we all know that money is not a pure index of wealth because you can just turn the printing press which is what we're doing with the Federal Reserve now. I don't know why we're not having hyperinflation, uh, but when the world gets scared, they want dollars, and that's protecting us a little bit right now. So, but a lot of people think we need a gold standard. <coughs> well, when the Spaniards went to the New World, they doubled the amount of gold, much of which ended up in the church, um, but they halved its value. It was no different from turning the printing press. Because where was the actual wealth coming from? The wealth was coming from photosynthesis. It was coming from the, the natural processes uh, and the work of foresters and fishermen and uh, agriculturalists and farmers and artisans and housewives that are actually doing the work to generate what wealth is. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So we want to have a different perspective, and all of these you see are related to energy. Energy is the basis of wealth. If you take the money out of our society, you can have an economy that continues based on barter or something else. You take the energy out as Cuba did, or the Russians did to Cuba in 1988, the economy just stops. Food disappeared from all of the stores within a week. And the Cubans adjusted to it in various clever ways, but it sure made a huge impact on them. So there's an unappreciated role of energy in economic production. It's very amazing for those economists here. You don't have energy in, in the Cobb-Douglas production functions. I mean, if you ask, I come to you as a physical, biophysical scientist, as somebody trained in physics and chemistry and biology and all of that. Uh, and if I were provided with the concept of economics as it's done by a freshman, 
I would give that freshman an A for cleverness and an F for reliability on his project. And let's take a look at that a little bit. So um, Richard told me Hawaii is a polite society and I've got to watch what I say, but my last two audiences have been egging me on. Uh, so if that's the case, then I apologize. But so let's take a look at some basic facts. Um, from 1830, this is the growth of the world economy. This is the growth of coal, oil, gas, uh, nuclear here in hydro. Oh, that little strip is what we're all excited about. That's wind turbines, uh, PV, photovoltaic, biofuels, and stuff like that. I mean, if we're going to do something with that, we've got to do a lot more than we've been doing so far because right now it's just adding to the mix. Now, where this is going to go in the future is quite unknown, but we're gonna, we've got some hints we'll look at today. <coughs> now, let's give you some idea of the importance of energy in economics. Remember, economists and their production functions don't include energy. But if you talk to a farmer and you say, well, how do you grow stuff? Well, let's take a look. This is a 33 horsepower combine. And this gives you an idea of what you need to do to have a pretty good combine. And you have to have all the feed and you know all the other stuff for the horses. I think they're mules, but it doesn't matter. OK, now let's take a look at a 200 horsepower harvester today driven by one guy, doesn't use energy when it's not working. And tell me where does wealth come from? Wealth comes from the Industrial Revolution. And let's go back a couple here. I was born in 1943. Look what's happened in my life. For the younger amongst you, what is this going to look like going into the future? Now, either we're going to run out of oil and something's going to happen, or we're not going to run out of oil, which is probably worse. Because what would happen to the world if this continued for another human lifetime? And I'm not even dead yet. So just to give you an idea, what an enormous thing this fossil fuel revolution is and the enormous impact it has had on our economy. And now we're replacing, not a very good picture, but we're even replacing workers with robots making cars. So that means you've got to have twice the throughput of steel and glass and copper per person employed. Some facts. In 1973, Liquid and gaseous petroleum provided about two-thirds of the energy of the U.S. economy. Now it's about the same, still. Petroleum, especially oil, is the fuel of choice for a lot of reasons that I'm not going to talk about too much here. Production of oil in the United States peaked in 1970. How many knew that? Okay. About a quarter of you, pretty high percentage for a lot of audiences. Today we produce only about half of what we did in 1970, some interesting things going on now. And the economies of the United States and the world run basically on fossil fuels. Fossil means old. Uh, and the recent headlines about the increasing supply of U.S. oil is, is not consistent with the facts, and uh, we'll probably talk more about that tomorrow. Now, this is what's called the Hubbard Curve. Uh, M. King Hubbard came up with the idea that over time, the use of a non-renewable resource would look something like a bell-shaped curve. Uh, he predicted in 1955 that U.S. oil production would peak in 1970, which it did. And the, there's a lot of uh, questions about whether or not we have peaked. This is conventional oil down here, whether we've peaked or not with conventional oil, probably if you're in the narrow definition we have. 
But then we got all this other stuff, this uh, Canadian and Venezuelan heavy stuff, tar sands, and uh, then we have some polar. Most of that's Alaska. Uh, natural gas liquids. Natural gas and non-conventional gas. This is the fracking stuff. That's uh, Colin Campbell's guess as to what the future might look like. Probably as good a guess as any. Um, it indicates a peak of oil somewhere around now. Don't know exactly, and a peak in gas perhaps sometime between now and 2020. Why do we know that? Why do we know the oil will peak? I don't know what that is. Um, it's because this is the rate for the world at which we found oil, and this is the rate at which we use oil. And as Richard said, we're using two or three barrels of oil for every barrel of oil that we find, and that's been consistent since 1990, and the situation is not getting better. Now, even my graduate students seem to have enough calculus to understand that the integral of this curve, wherever it goes, cannot be greater than the integral of this curve. You can't use more than you find. And finding oil has become a very, very tough proposition and a very expensive proposition. Um, now, three new reports say that the United States will be an oil exporter. Uh, this is not looking good. This looks like a, something's flipped on my PowerPoints. Bear with me. It won't make much difference. But I don't know what... Whoop, I don't know what these things are. I didn't put them there. Uh, and, this is and this is supposed to be up on the top. So, just, um, so here is uh, U.S. production of oil. And it's been a little uptick here. It's uh, another year or two of uptick. Everybody's very excited about that, and you've heard, uh, and we'll look at that more closely. It's true. It's real. You cannot say the U.S. is in an inevitable decline in the production of oil. But now, the most, the pronouncement that got the most legs was the European IEA, not to be confused with the American EIA, where uh, basically one person said the U.S. will become a net exporter of oil. <coughs> uh, for those who came in late, I have a very bad cold. Um, and so, but even this pronouncement, here we are now, is based on the following. This is the production of conventional oil from existing wells, which they agree will be declining. I don't know where they get this leveling off. Uh, if you better not tell Thunder Horse, our largest uh, remaining oil well, because it's dropping like a stone. But anyway, they say that will be more or less flat for a while. This is from fields yet to be developed and that we found, and this is from currently producing fields. So you see that's conventional oil is flat, and then this is natural gas liquids. Natural gas, they're, what they're doing, the people who are optimists, by optimist meaning people who think there's going to be a large quantity of oil, uh, like to throw in natural gas liquids, which is not the same as oil. You can't run a car on it, or, or not without doing a, a lot of stuff to it. But okay, let's accept that. And this is other unconventional oil. And the big thing here is what's called light tight oil. That's from uh, Eagle Ford, Texas, in Bakken. North Dakota and Montana, mostly. And you see, this is where we get more oil than we did, produced even at the peak. Well, it's, none of this stuff is really oil. So uh, you got to be careful about your definitions, and you got to be careful about what you can do with what. Now, Tad Batsik, which who I understand has been here in Hawaii, uh, gave me this graph, which I think is kind of interesting. So here's the actual production of oil. This is the little uptick we've had. And Tad thinks, well, this is the basic oil production from Texas, Louisiana, California, 
the onshore stuff. And we have these little blips. This is an important blip here. Um, this one is uh, this one is the offshore Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this one he is his guess for the light tight oil. Not very much. And imposed upon a decline. So he's thinking that, oh, no, I'm sorry, this little blip here. Oh, and this is if we go and exploit the uh, Arctic uh, wildlife refuge. So it, you can get some bumps in the road, and we need a lot more science on this, what is the potential size of each of these. And I'm going to give you some tools to do that science yourself. Here are some facts for Hawaii. Again, that's supposed to be on the top. The economy of Hawaii runs basically on oil, 90%. Electricity is about two-thirds from oil. The price of oil almost certainly will keep coming up. Well, I've got the optimist scenario for you. The optimist scenario for you is that the price of oil will come down. Is that right? That would be good from Hawaii's perspective. And all of everything that I've been able to read, this is the way we can get the oil to come down. And that is that we have global recession. I can't see any other way. Because if we don't have recession, as I'll explain later today and tomorrow, we will be required to produce from more expensive fields. It takes more money to get the oil out of the ground. So uh, there we are. So Hawaiian economy cannot afford even $90 a barrel oil. I don't think so. The last I looked, oil was $93 a barrel. And when, uh, well, we'll see how this works out a little bit later. Now here's, that was the good news. Here's the bad news for Hawaii. Hawaii is Asian. Looks east, or is it west? Looks west. I'm having some problems here adjusting geographically. Um, and you're importing oil from a part of the world that uses a lot of oil but doesn't produce much. You're, producing, you're importing it, I understand, mostly from Malaysia, Indonesia, and so forth. <coughs> but all of the oil exporting countries basically are going through this. This happens to be Saudi Arabia. This is the production. At some point, you're going to go over the Hubbard curve. But what's happening is, here we are, up, data is up to about here. What, this is what oil consumption is, so that the oil producing nations sell oil cheaply, have a lot of industries moving there, and are using more and more oil. So this squeeze here means that there's going to be less oil available for the rest of the world. And if you put them all together, this is the top 16 exporters. Um, the top of the curve is what's going to be facing Hawaii, I presume. And, and all of them are going through the same process. So you're going to be competing for the most expensive oil, and you're going to be competing with China and India. And they have our dollars, if you hadn't noticed. So as long as the dollar's worth something, they got them in the bank. We, we got debt. Much of that debt has been to continue on our oil-intensive lifestyle. Now, I don't argue that you shouldn't import oil. Oil's great stuff, but we got to think about it in greater depth. Now, speaking to an academic audience, um, and thank you for inviting me on beautiful campus you have. I just walked around in the quad, like the old buildings. Um, Economics must incorporate energy to one's thinking and teaching. It does not. And we'll go through some of the procedures by which that is the truth. Now, there is a, I'm not the only one to criticize contemporary economics, which is called neoclassical economics, which has been around since about 1880 or so, uh, and which focuses on markets and satisfying human wants and needs. It's a social science. Now, if I ask you, any one of you, and 
to think about what does economics mean to you. And I don't mean economics in the university. I mean economics, what does it mean to you personally? What does it mean in your home? What does it mean to your family? And after, I don't know what's happening here. Um, and so, uh, and so what economics means to most people is food on the table, a roof over the head, uh, maybe some access to transportation, access to university. Um, and if you look at these things pretty carefully, what you find is that economics is about stuff. It's about the material things like food you might want to eat, roof over your head, and the energy to provide services. Why is economics taught to a million young people in our universities as a social science? Why is it not at least equally a biophysical science? And we had at Hilo quite a bit of interest in trying to derive uh, an issue, uh, 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 a program, a series of courses, something that would be focused on developing a systems approach to the future of Hawaii that would be focusing equally at least on the biophysical economics as well as the conventional economics. Now, there's, I'm not the only one to say this. There's all kinds of people in economics, again, I'm sorry this thing is flipped, uh, that recent Nobel Prize winners, uh, Sen and Kahneman and Stiglitz and Ackerman and a number of others, have gotten their Nobel Prizes in economics basically for undermining the basic neoclassical model. But that hasn't filtered down to our teaching, and it hasn't filtered down to what's in uh, the economics textbook. So um, Now, so... <laughs> What is economics? It should be up here. Um, well, we all know the answer to economics is a study of the allocation of scarce uh, resources among competing ends. Now, scarce resources in this way, way is basically money in your wallet. It's not resources as you might think about it from a biophysical perspective, from the natural science perspective. It isn't about water or soil or fish or agricultural production or whatever. So. The standard economic model goes like something like this. It's about households and firms. And this is in uh, the first chapter of basically every econ textbook. And then uh, there you go. Here's the model of how the economy works. And uh, put some economic terms on it. And you go from there. Do very, very fancy, complicated mathematics but it's starting somewhere like that. So from a standard view of economics, then this is for 1990. Uh, the input to the economy is $5,000 of capital, 2,000 hours of labor, and GDP is 20,000. That's the output. That's the input and the output of the US economy per person per year. Uh, it is social definition, and it implies that scarcity is only relative scarcity, that humans are rational. I mean, there's all these assumptions that are required in your basic economic model. I mean, that are absolutely required to make the model work like humans are rational. Come on. So, I mean, even Gintis, uh, economist at Harvard, did actually did experiments on what people do. It's just amazing. And he found out that people are far more likely to be altruistic or vindictive than they are to be rational by the definition of self-regarding that the economists require for their model. That if somebody is playing the game in the marketplace <coughs> and somebody else is cheating, that they, the first person, will give up money to punish the person that's not playing by the rules. They are not self-regarding. They're vindictive. They will try to punish the person not playing by the rule. And we can go on and on and on. 
Uh, let's see, our second quite different definition of economics comes from Payani. Economics is the study of how people transform nature to meet their needs. I like this. I'm an ecologist. It makes sense. I'm not a tree hugger ecologist. I'm someone who studies the relations of nature. That's what an ecologist should be. It shouldn't have anything to do with what your opinion is on saving the earth or anything. So here's an equally legitimate view of the U.S. economy for the same boundaries, the same one person, one year. In order to get that output that we looked at, you need an input of 2,500 kilograms of oil, 3,000 of coal, gas, 2,000 kilograms, and so forth, uh, 140,000 kilograms of water, all this stuff up here. And the output is not just GDP, but this stuff. That's a biophysical view of the U.S. economy. And it is equally or more legitimate as a view of the economy as is the first firms and households model that I showed you. None of this exists in any economic textbook I've ever seen. And even where, as in e.g. ecological economics, people are trying to expand the boundaries and so forth, they are still starting from the price-based assumption that money is the proper index of value. Now, that's a more complicated question I won't get into in my lecture. You can ask me about it if you wish later, but... Okay, now, we know that economies are about this kind of thing, and I've read the book Hawaii by Missioner, and that's what this book is about, as far as I can tell. But this happens to be Montana. The K. Ross Tool is the great historian of Montana. And these are their cycles of exploitation from 1800 to 2000, beaver, gold, silver, eastern dry land forming. That, that was a big one. Then the soil all grew, blew away. Um, and then we had copper. That was the biggest one. And timber. Now we're trying to run like Hawaii on tur tourists and maybe agriculture. So or we can look at Ecuador. This is data on Ecuador. These are the exploitation cycles. Uh, you know, wiping out the local fish uh, first, and then we uh, do the shrimp farming until white spot disease comes in, and then we do coffee until we poison the soils, like you poisoned your soils with arsenic in Hawaii. Uh, and now the whole economy is running on oil, which of course isn't going to last for very long. It will peak sooner or later. Perhaps it is already by the data. So, Pagliani is right. Economics is about the exploitation of nature. And Hall would add, using energy. So, for me, economics is, is very simple. For every dollar this, you spend, the equivalent of about a small coffee cup, let's say half of this, of oil or its equivalent of other fuel is used to generate the goods and services represented by that dollar. So if you buy a bagel, some energy is, some energy is used in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana to make the fertilizer. Some energy is used to barge it up to Nebraska to spread it on the field. Some energy is used to run the tractor to put the fertilizer on the field, then to plant, harvest, grind the flour, flour up, weed up into flour, put it on a train, and ship it to Syracuse or to Hawaii. And then uh, the, at the bagel place, the guy runs his oven or boils a pot of water to make your bagel. So it takes about, on average, <clears throat> this much oil, six or seven megajoules on average for a dollar's worth of something. So every time you spend a dollar for the next week, then I want you to think about that much oil being used and turned into about a pound of CO2, half a kilogram of CO2. And th that's what the economy is. It's biophysical. Spend $100, multiply it by 100. Spend 1,000, you go, go where you want. Uh, as natural scientists, we believe that the neoclassical models of economics uses incorrect boundaries is inconsistent with laws of thermodynamics. Where is the law of uh, laws of thermodynamics in that firms and household models. 
is largely based on articles of faith rather than empirically validated science. That you, if you accept neoclassical economics, it's like going to church. You know, you believe or you don't. Is it our business to ask why you believe? So, it is neither labor nor capital that generates wealth, but nature, including especially the energies used by nature and also by humans to exploit nature. This uh, should be up on the top. We need a new approach to economics. I call it biophysical economics. So here is the minimum diagram I would accept in our freshman or sophomore economics book as to what an economy is about. You start with energy sources. I don't know what this yellow stuff is. The economists don't enter this into their equations because it doesn't enter the market. But it's the most important thing. And then we have uh, uh, natural, that's not supposed to happen here. Um, and then we have the natural ecosystems here that put down in the past uh, reduced carbon into fossil fuels, concentrated minerals, and then humans come along and do exploitation with a farm, with uh, it's not a pejorative name, it's just what we do. Uh, chainsaws, dams, dig stuff out of the ground, processing, a butcher block, a sawmill, a petroleum refinery, a power plant, a steel furnace, uh, manufacturing, <clears throat> here's fiber, uh, food fiber, all kinds of stuff in a factory. And you notice that there is energy and matter going along in all of this food chain. It's ecology. Then we have consumption. This boundary is where neoclassical conventional economics gets all excited about market processes and stuff. But you know, they this is, all of this is necessary, all this stuff over here. We've got to teach our young people to think that way. And our old people, too. And there's heat loss at every juncture by the second law of thermodynamics. You can't use oil twice. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I want to replace that firms and household diagram with this for our sophomores in Econ 201 or whatever it is. <coughs> so there you have it. Is that what we're doing? No, it's not what we're doing. Next question: Haven't the earlier biophysical models been negated? Remember Barnett and Morse. Any economists in here might know about that. Paul Ehrlich's bet limits your growth. So uh, mostly and arrogantly, economists think that this, what I'm talking about up here, is a pile of crap, and they will bring up a series of academic and other papers that will, they think support their point of view, but they're wrong. Uh, Barnett and Morse, who's heard of Barnett and Morse? One person in the back, okay, well, you gotta read Cleveland's revisiting Barnett and Morse, because the reason the prices of commodities stayed constant over the period which it did the examination was the price of energy came down, and you use more but cheaper energy to produce the natural resources from lower and lower quality resources. That's why Barnett and Morse is not, does not support what they say, although you read Barnett and Morse carefully, they were no fools, they, they didn't screw up. Paul Ehrlich made this, who's heard of Paul Ehrlich's bet? Quite a few more, and, and that was a stupid bet, as he says, I know him pretty well, and he said he was cornered into that bet, if he made that bet today, he would have made a fortune. Um, you don't make a bet on the price of things going up when there's a recession, an oil price increase induced recession. Limits to growth, this is the big one. How many have heard of the limits to growth? Of those of you, a lot of you, how those of you who heard of limits to growth, how many think it's failed? Huh? Nobody. One person, okay. Uh, two people. So, a lot of people think the limits to growth has failed. Uh, here's Ehrlich. And here's the basic model in limits to growth. Limits to growth, for those of you who don't know, was this very influential book that was uh, published in 1972. They made a model of the future of the world, and they had all kinds of uh, large fluctuations 
in the human population, pollution, resources going down, food per capita going up and then down, industrial output crashing. And boy, the economists did not like this. Now, I'm not going to argue that this model is correct, but I'm going to argue something else. They didn't like this, and they published all kinds of stuff. Here's one. There's lots of them. Been really beautifully reviewed in a, a new book by Ugo Bardi in a series that I edit on energy for Springer. And Bardi is the last two chapters in that book. If you're interested in, in the social situation of arguing about resources, you want to read those last two chapters because they're brilliant. So anyway, I wrote a, a, an article with John Day about this too, an American scientist, 2009, Graham Turner, done the same thing. And they said these are pretty good criticisms. They did not refer to a single scientific study. There's a clear possibility that development of nuclear fusion, remember that one, uh, will open up a vast and perhaps enormously cheap source of energy. When I was uh, at Brookhaven Lab in 1970, fusion was only 30 years away, and now it's only 40 years away. Uh, and, and, you know, basically, they have a lot of faith in technology. And so, since most of these oscillations did not come to pass, most economists believe that they were, uh, that the, the predictions were pure fantasy. And they thought the market had solved the problem, and you'll still hear that today. The oil issue has, in the last uh, few, I guess we better say months and years, disappeared from the media. Growth returned as a god. Da, da, da. Cassandra's, don't forget Cassandra was right, incidentally. Um, you can't, you know, I've, I've uh, got a lot of money to do really junky research in my life. Uh, millions of dollars to do various environmental fuzzy things, but uh, many millions. But all of the work I've done on the most important stuff, which I consider EROI, which I'll talk about tomorrow, is, uh, was done on a shoestring. It was done pro bonum, as it were, or on the backs of graduate students that believed in this. The economists won the debate. Cost-benefit analysis is how we make decisions in our society. Now, econ economics is Trump science. Uh, yeah, I just said that. And uh, there's all these, you know, there's, this, uh, there's such junk in the political debate. We, won't, we don't want to go there, do we? Okay, but uh, let market make all the decisions. Closely held secret is, you know, the problem with that first thing is that, is that they didn't have, they didn't have ticks on their uh, horizontal axis because they didn't have the computer technology to do that at the time, 1972, you know. So using my great scientific tools of uh, variable scale uh, Xerox machine and a ruler, um, I put on some... Uh, Markers, and, and we could say that as of, we're right about here, as of right here, that model, including the, some of these running a little bit flat now, all of these are right on the money. Graham Turner has found that too. You cannot say that the, this model will fail when we get to the interesting parts, but you cannot say that it's failed yet. In fact, after 35 years, we have no economic model. It's within 5% and all its seven parameters like this is. It's amazing. Maybe 10%, but mostly five. Ah, oh, there we go. Well, here's some things. We found no substitutes for oil. Oil production still is more or less peaked. Uh, we'll talk about that some more tomorrow, etc. Most other resource issues have been bailed out with cheap oil. Well, I mean, we destroy soils all around the world, and then we make up for it with, with oil-derived or petroleum-derived uh, fertilizers. That's what you do in Hawaii, right, Richard? Yep, and uh, we overfish, so we just use more oil to go further away to catch somebody else's fish, etc. Now, here's an interesting issue here. Uh, speaking to you as a system scientist, uh, one of the things we think about is stability. This, this is, uh, has negative stability. Any little tremor will knock the marble off the pencil point. So that's unstable. 
This is neutrally stable. If you poke it, it'll roll along the table until friction stops it. The most interesting is this question of uh, positive stability that you roll the marble up a bowl, and if it falls off your finger, it'll go back to the same place. And that's a real interesting question for ecosystems, and it's a real interesting question for societies. How much resilience, that is, returning to the original conditions, do we have? In my graduate student, uh, and incidentally, you know when I say anything that, uh, that, that I did this or we did that, when I say I, it's probably we, and when I say we, it's them, my graduate students. They, <laughs> so th there's layers and layers and layers of analysis behind what I'm up here telling you. I've published 10 stupid books and 270 scientific papers, so if you want to, just not shooting from the hip here, um, mostly about energy. But this is David Murphy's, I will say that. So he, uh, he's interested in this question for oil. And this is another important one for Hawaii. So you got to remember, it's not just energy that grows the economy, it's cheap energy. We grew the United States economy on $2.50 a barrel, not gallon, $200.50 a barrel, it's 42 gallons, petroleum. So it's cheap energy, and every time the price of oil gets up to about five and a half or six percent of the U.S. economy at least, and there's more data than I have here, this is just a convenient graph, we have a recession. Now Hawaii is up here somewhere, I don't know exactly how it works in Hawaii, and what happens is that, as I'll show tomorrow better, when you, when energy becomes expensive, as a percent of GDP, you eliminate discretionary spending. And it's discretionary expending, spending that drives much of the expansion of the economy. Now, what's happening is we're getting more and more of our oil offshore. Guess what? Offshore oil is a lot more expensive than onshore oil. And it takes a lot more energy. And so if, we, if we're using not much oil in the U.S. or world economy, we can use the cheap stuff available still from Saudi Arabia, from the Middle East and other areas. But if we go up until we're using 90 or more uh, barrels per day, then we have to go into more and more expensive oil from Angola, from Russia, from Norway. Uh, Canadian tar sands are quite different, oil sands, and U.S. stripper wells, that just means old, small wells. So when you go this direction, when your economy expands, you go in this direction, that pushes you up on this axis, and that leads to recession, the economies contract and you come back down here. So that's why the U.S. economy is not going anywhere. Now, it's not doing badly. It's the U.S. economy is as large as it's ever been. If we believe the inflation corrections anyway, that's another question, but um, it's as large as it's ever been. It's people have been hooked into somehow the first derivative is what's important, not the whole thing. Growth is what's important. I think the days of growth are gone. I think the days of stock market growth are basically gone, and, the, and uh, the growth of our economy, basically. So, summary of the facts, inexpensive energy has been used to provide steady economic growth in the past. Finding less oil than oil we find is expensive, creating a volatile price situation, which you certainly know about in Hawaii. Economics lot remains largely about investing energy and exploiting nature. This needs to be the first principle of teaching economics, not something marginalized. In the long run, nature holds the high cards. Various conclusions now. I mean, is this what it's going to be? This is our use of energy, of high quality energy. And there we were three million years ago, and here we are now, 100 years or so of whoop-de-doo. 
and uh, blasting off her energy for all kinds of things. Uh, and, and this is going into the future. Is that going to be our ancestors going into the future? Well, I don't, I'm not an off the cliffer. I, I just think things are going to be tight. And uh, the important thing is most of our economic and financial theories were derived here. Current U.S. Global, global oil and energy situation is here somewhere. Our economic theories aren't working so well. We don't have a clue what to do. And I'm saying that maybe University of Hawaii, with its uh, great sensitivity to the energy issue, is a, a, a good test bed to thinking about this. But you'd have to make some different kind of investments, and that requires leadership from college presidents and deans and all kinds of people. And I saw quite a lot of this at Hilo. I don't know what's going to happen. I haven't talked to many people here yet because I've been sick. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I, may, I recommend this book. <laughs> it's all there. It's available out of Google. Not cheap, 80-something dollars. But it comes with a guarantee. If you buy it, you don't think it's worth what you paid for it, I'll buy it back from you for whatever you paid for it. And I would love to see it used in teaching economics here. Well, my final professional goal, that says neoclassical economics there. You can't see that too well. In fact, I think, yeah, there, it's better there. So. Uh, so, and it is inconceivable to me that the market or conventional economics is providing useful signals for foreseeing or dealing with these issues. In fact, by glorifying trivial and manipulated taste, by worshiping growth, by ignoring such issues as population growth, the most important issue, and resource depletion, the market approach is greatly exacerbating these very difficult problems. So, there you go. Sure, I thought I'd be lying on the floor now, but I seem to be still kicking, so nothing like an adrenaline rush. Questions? No questions? Is this all obvious to you? It's what you got in your economics classes anyway? The people, the students at Hilo were much better at asking questions. Okay, somebody back there, number one, and here's your number two. Yes? based on oil price rather than oil quantity produced. Um, how, did you, how did you equate for that? Um, well, I, I'm trying to address that question with my colleague, Carrie King of the University of Texas. And uh, we've written one paper together. We're trying to get some more data. He's got some more data, but we haven't published it yet. That shows uh, a pretty good curve, R squared of 0.8 something. We would have loved to have that back in the, my biology days. Um, but not perfect. Uh, if you take away the subsidies, the price of energy, uh, you got it's a quality thing. Electricity, for example, is a little different. But uh, is a function of energy return on investment. And as energy return on investment declines, the price goes up in a way that's predictable from a curve you can derive from the data points that you have. So I think I'm answering your question. I think that energy return on investment is driving the process. And that price is a response. Since I see nothing on the horizon that's going to decrease energy, that's going to increase energy return on investment, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. I'll talk about the Bakken, and I'll talk about stuff like that. <clears throat> Since I see nothing on the horizon that is going to decrease the price, uh, the EROI of oil, except using less through a recession, as I showed in one of the graphs, then my guess is the price of oil will keep going up or at least stay somewhere where it is now. One more back, sir. Yeah. As oil becomes harder to come by, human labor, an hour of human labor will earn us less oil. What do you think people are going to be changing in their lives to account for that over time? 
Well, the easy way to change is get poorer. I mean, none of us want to do that, right? It's not, I guess what we're talking about here in Hawaii is to try to figure out how we can do this without becoming desperately poor. And, and I, but I think this is happening. If you pay attention to the news, Europe has stopped growing. Japan is into its second last decade of no growth at all. Um, U.S. is having problems. Uh, Europe, any European uh, leader would be delighted to have Obama's problems about economic growth, but it's not too much in the U.S. either. Um, if you do a proper correction for inflation, we have, may have had no growth for 20 years. I don't know. If you're interested in that question, go look at shadow statistics and think about it. Uh, so. I think what I'm talking about is not into the future. I think it's happening now. If you hadn't noticed, states are broke. Uh, you know, 40 odd of 50 states are broke. Uh, in our state, entire cities like Rochester, a big city in New York, is broke. Uh, all kinds of small cities are broke. They can't fix the roads, they can't fix the bridges, they can't pay for the school buses. Um, they're eliminating. Tragically, they're eliminating band and sports and other stuff for kids. And all of, I'll talk about this tomorrow, about the Maslow pyramid of what you can do at various energy return on investment. So uh, in Syracuse, it's, uh, we had a magnificent symphony orchestra. Well, we can't afford it anymore. Now, of course, we have an issue of who's paying how much taxes and not going to go there, but uh, it's pretty clear to me you know, in pensions. Probably a lot of you know that uh, your pensions or your people you know pensions just all of a sudden are worth nothing. Um, and all of these things we talk about in our book are uh, attributable explicitly to um, declining energy return on investment and peak oil. I'd like to leave it on that picture. A number of studies have suggested that we can, in fact, run our industrial civilization through the rest of the century, at least on renewable energy, mainly wind and solar. Yeah. The same studies have suggested the transition will be difficult. I wonder what your views are on the future with respect to renewable energy as a substitute for fossil fuels. Uh, well, first of all, we all, including me, would like to shift to renewable energy. <coughs> but you saw how thin that line was. We've got a lot of work to do if that's what we're going to do. And it's not clear. Here's the problem, the real problem, I think, is at a time when consumption is becoming less, will people be willing to be taxed more, one way or another, to invest in whatever these alternatives are? Now, I think that Hawaii should tax their their gasoline at a dollar a gallon to make a fund to give you some options. And what's the best one? Well, it's not quite as nice as you might think. Um, that what I've just done with Pedro Prieto, who's more or less the top solar engin engineer for Spain. We just wrote a book on Spain's photovoltaic uh, future, and we examined Spain being the second largest photovoltaic uh, country in the world at the time. Um, <clears throat> and he would, he would sign for every expenditure on, on the sites that he was constructing, that he was the uh, chief engineer. And he made a photocopy of them, and then we wrote a book on all of those, because he felt that each time he was signing for something, he was signing for fossil fuel that was being used to crush gravel for the roads and move it there with trucks, huge amounts of stuff, and, and build fences and security f systems and, you know, 30 different things that you get. If you just look at the, the ingots, if you just look at the, the uh, collectors, you, you can look pretty good, a lot of good technology going on there. But when you look at the whole thing, uh, we ended up with a 2.45 energy return on investment. Not great, for sure, and maybe it's, it, but if you took three units of, soil or of coal, think about it this way, it's may, maybe more positive, 
you get one unit of electricity in a thermal plant or three units of, of, uh, of coal and you could get seven units of electricity, but over 25 years. So probably a lot has to do with the discount rate. And Pedro does not think that these, uh, in Spain anyway, these collectors are gonna last anything like 25 years. Uh, wind is more favorable, probably. And this kind of analysis hasn't been done. This is the kind of thing I'd like to see done by your engineers, economists, systems thinkers working together for Hawaii. And we all know the problem of wind. It's when the wind doesn't blow. And so I was just at a very windy site, and I asked the guy that lived there, um, Monty Richards, I said, how do you ever have two-week periods when the wind doesn't blow? And he said, of course. Well, you can't build a reservoir for two weeks, and you can't build a for pump storage. You can't, you can't store electricity. Forget about batteries. It's useless. And you got to pump water uphill, and you can't build reservoirs in Hawaii because the soil is too porous. So there's a lot of things you need to... Now, can you build a big reservoir and line it with plastic? I don't know. How much energy does that plastic cost? These are questions we need to know more about. So I think one thing you do have in Hawaii is the wind blows 60 percent of the time. Most places in the world it's 20 or 30 percent in favorable locations. So um, that, uh, you know, I visited the Puma geothermal site. The, that looked, uh, looked pretty good to me unless Pele is unhappy with it. And then it's maybe not such a good investment. But uh, all of these things have pluses and minuses that you can need some statisticians and working with geologists to figure out these things and spread things out to cover your bets and all kinds of, th these are really interesting questions, I think. But they've got to be done right. And they are not, in Hawaii, they're not being done right. They're just being done by advocacy groups, the same as anywhere else. So we need, we need independent university groups. Is your university independent? No? Well, I, I would like to, we talked about this at Hilo quite a bit, I, I would like to, because Hawaii has a lot of attention and respect for the, the folks that were here a long time ago, uh, I think that there might be, as you say, quite a lot to learn from their cultures, at least we want to, the term I've learned, you know, talk to the uh, uncles and aunties about, bring them into the discussion as well. And uh, yes, indeed. Um, Maybe, maybe our lifestyle is going to have to be different, but that, let me tell you where that doesn't work. It doesn't work for tourists, because they're spoiled rotten. It also doesn't work for our young people who are spoiled rotten, some of them. And so, uh, you know, um, good luck. Is that thing on? All right, go, go. Because you're an island with no energy resources. Well, I mean, then you can get into, you know, evil uh, corporations and stuff, or maybe not evil corporations, whatever, wherever you choose. I don't know. I've been here for seven days. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I look at Honolulu, and I'm, you know, my wife and I are kind of freaked out. It's just another stupid city. Yeah. And so I, I don't like cities. I'm moving to the middle of nowhere in Montana. Um, so, but if you like cities, I suppose it's a nice city and the weather's nice. Um, Hawaii is, well, let me tell you some good news about Hawaii. Hawaii is uh, 49th, I understand, in the energy intensity per person, and it has the same GDP on av as the average American, all of us together. So, Hawaii is, appears to be relatively energy efficient, even if that energy is from oil. Well, why? Well, you know, where I come from, you freeze to death half the year, so you've got to use a lot of fuel just to stay warm. 
And uh, the, the other half of the United States, you've got to use a lot of air conditioning. I don't know how much you use here, but you've got trade winds in the summer. It's not too bad. So uh, Hawaii is, uh, in, and besides, you don't have any place to go. Unless you get on a plane. You can only go around the island so many times, you know. Individuals do what you want. You know, our students uh, work all year. They, they, eat, uh, they eat brown rice and, and other cheap stuff and eat low on the food chain. And then at the end of the semester, they go down and look at the rainforest in Costa Rica, you know. So uh, I don't like to use the word should. Uh, I don't like to tell anybody else what to do. Uh, the carbon issue is a whole other thing. Uh, my views are, I don't want to go there. I mean, it's clear that the world is warming, but it's not quite clear that it's due to human activity. But it probably is. And we could really dig into this a lot. And I, to me, this peak oil issue and EROI issues are much cleaner than the carbon issue. If you want to do carbon, you know, if, if all these Climate guys are right, you know, this, which is going to be worse, running out of oil or, or having some kind of climate catastrophe? Or do we just evolve? You know, nature, nature evolves. May or may not include us. I'm not worried about the future of the planet as an ecologist because we've been through all kinds of big cycles. So, okay, we have another one. Then the dolphins are in charge next time. I don't know. Uh, so, um, now I would miss particular birds and fish, but... Uh, I don't think we're doing a damn thing about the climate. We can't even get, we can't even stick to Kyoto. The United, US though is meeting its Kyoto um, targets. You know that? I just found that out this morning. Why is the US meeting its Kyoto targets? It's, it's because the economy has crashed. That's, the economy has stopped growing. And our use of, uh, we're using more natural gas, tearing apart Pennsylvania instead of Texas. So, um, hmm. Controlling people, come on, get real. <laughs> you, you, you know, these environmentalists think that they can say something and people, you know what the last election debates were about? Who could deplete the oil wells the fastest? Now, you think, you're going to run uh, and win? Oh, I got a plan to deplete, to grow the economy less than my, my um, alternative here? No. Everybody's trying to pump up the economy as fast as they can, right? Even Richard. Um, we got another talk. Uh, tomorrow, and it's going to focus more on energy return on investment, a little bit more on the biophysical aspects of these, but at the end, another economic consequence with respect to discretionary income. Anybody want to be on my energy list, sir? Just give me your card and write ELS on the back. My God, I... I did it.